find a seated position. I'm going to talk for a while, for a little bit longer than normal today. Um, because pride is really interesting. And I think it's quite a sensitive topic for... Um, for uh, Westerners because we have this notion, especially like Americans, you know, proud to be American and everything. And there are acceptable versions of pride. And then there are um, unhelpful and quite damaging versions of pride. So this is, sorry, I totally thought I was ready, but I wasn't. Um, that's why I'm going to spend a bit more time. Let me just concentrate on this and then... Oh, I can't find it. Okay, I found it. All right, so, um, yes. So, first of all, pride, arrogance, deceit. We're kind of grouping or I'm grouping them all together. Um, again, just as a caveat, so... I, um, um, I do study Buddhism, I haven't taken vows, but I combine what I know from Buddhism and what I know from psychology and I put it together. And because we're talking about pride, I feel like I have to, um, <laughs> to give the caveat that, you know, I'm no by means an expert. Um, just as Buddha said, anything I say, please question either with me or with somebody, you know, with a monk or someone who's studied Buddhism a lot longer than me. Um, but it's just some information just to get you thinking. And I was watch as I was watching some videos yesterday about pride, um, Thupten Chaldron, who is quite an interesting woman, she is a, a nun who was married, I think she has kids, um, and then decided to become a nun and take the vows. So uh, she has quite a lot of stuff, and because she was a Westerner, she's American, she relates it as well, and she's quite an expert. But what she was saying um, was, uh, you know, you have to question, oh, if you think in a different way, then you are not even thinking in a different way. But if you're just presented with this and doing analytical meditation, then your mind doesn't have time or space to worry about other things. So I guess that's, you can just consider this. It'll probably be closer to half an hour today as something that you can do. So what is pride? It is an exaggerated evaluation of the self and others. So it often is based on devaluating of others and it results as an attachment to the self and an aversion to others. So somebody who's really proud, you know, and I mean this is the un unhealthy pride that somebody would carry thinks, I know they're superior to other people and um, that they don't need anybody else around in their life because they know everything. They got it, you know, nobody can teach them anything and it's just boring to have to be around these people who don't know anything. I guess from the psychological point of view, we would probably call that a narcissist, but there's also people who have narcissistic tendencies that, um, that aren't necessarily narcissistic or different phases in your life as well. It's linked to self-esteem. That's just what narcissism is. So actually, pride is the opposite to having low self-worth. But they're both equally as damaging, and they're both self-centered, and they're both focused or based from that ego that we are, you know, the centers of the universe. And again, I just want to reiterate how... Welcome if you're just joining us. I just want to reiterate about... I'm not talking about the proud... Uh, the pride where you feel good about something, because everybody should feel good about something. What I'm talking about is an excess feeling of pride where it becomes arrogance, where we start to ignore others or close ourselves off from others because we know best. This is the kind of proud. Actually, Trump does a really good job of that. He's such a good example for a lot of these teachings. But, you know, it's um, people just don't even want to be around someone like that. It affects relationships, it affects friendships. We don't want to be around a know-it-all. And I was, as I was listening to some lectures on pride, I found something really interesting because I know a lot of kids, you know, from a lot of my friends, family members have small children and, you know, they want to play games together. 
So we play games and then sometimes I let them win or sometimes I'm like, you know, that's not really teaching them anything about life. But the reaction that they get when they lose is unbelievable and that's pretty much everybody. And I was just, I've been sitting for a long time wondering how I can possibly begin to facilitate a different reaction to losing because we lose, like for instance, I didn't get rejected by a job or really from, I mean that's not true, from a job I didn't get rejected, I got rejected by other things until I was 26 years old. And when I didn't get a job, it was the most devastating thing, you know, 26 year old, because nobody taught me how to deal with it. It was always, you're the best, you're the cleverest, you're gonna get it because of your smile, you're gonna get it because of this. So I didn't know how to handle being rejected and it was like a huge blow on the ego. So I think it's really important and what Supton Children was saying about this concept of winning and losing and because she's American, she and I'm American as well, I, I, when I say Western, I really mean American culture because there's other Western cultures that don't have this so strong. But it's, you gotta beat this guy. You know, you came, come home from a sporting event. Did you win? No, oh, that's too bad. Better luck next time. You know, like, what can you do to win next time? You gotta beat everybody. And like, as you're beating everybody, you're actually beating yourself up. You know, and you're, you're doing this thing that's so unhelpful where you're either making yourself inferior or superior to somebody. And at the meantime, causing this whole chain of unhealthy, difficult, struggling relationships. Whereas in Eastern society, there's this concept of collectiveness. So instead of saying to a child, did you win or lose? Did you have fun? You know, if you like, for instance, for me modeling, and when that little kid is over there, yes, I won, and like jumping and screaming, and oh my God, this, oh, I'm so smart and clever. I'd be like, oh, I had so much fun. It doesn't matter that I lost. You know, it's really fun. We got to spend some time together. It's, it's emphasizing what really matters because the last thing we want to do is um, is develop children, small children who grow up to have really big egos because really big egos means that we're sensitive to everything. We can't ha handle criticism. We can't handle rejection. We can't handle all of these difficult things that aren't difficult if we have a mind frame. Everybody gets rejected from a job. It was just, I didn't. I was the one that always got the job. I mean, I sent off like probably in the last two weeks, 50 job applications. Have I heard anything? No. Do I care? No. Because, you know, I'm not the best candidate. I'm the right candidate for somebody, but that hasn't come yet. So I do what I can. So that's the kind of pride. We don't want to devaluate others. We want to feel good about ourselves without devaluating others. Wow, you know, like I studied really hard on that exam and I got an, um, 50%. It's not, you know, but I did so good because I like tried my best. It's not, oh, I got a 50% and all those people that got 50% better than me, you know, or all those people that got worse, at least I'm not the stupid one, at least I'm in the middle. Like that's, that's where the pride comes, um, dangerous in the middle. So if we know it all, we won't listen to other people. And I don't know how many times I've done this new thing um, and it, it's taken, I've started it years ago and I'm starting to finally feel comfortable with it. When somebody tells me something I already know, like for instance, in the chauvinistic sailing industry, you know, telling me how to tie a line, um, telling me how to throw a line, which actually I do need help with that. Uh, but certain are tying knots. There's certain things, are you cleaning? Like this is, you know, I just, sometimes I'm just like, I have two master's degrees and I uh, do, don't really know how to clean. Like I can figure out that that's dirty and I need to clean it, you know? And and this thing of like, when I first started the industry, even now there's so much that I don't know, but that's okay. And then I've done this thing where somebody's telling me something I already know and instead of getting annoyed and instead of thinking, I know that or like, oh, actually you're telling me this, but I know a better way of doing it, I listen because I may learn a different way of doing it. I may just become more humble, you know, and, and I act with interest, like as if I don't know that. And then when I do it, you know, it's like, they can either decide for themselves that they're the best teacher in the whole entire world, which is their issue, or they can say, oh yeah, she knows how to do it. She can get on with it. I don't need to spend more time doing that. So it's a really interesting and incredibly challenging thing to do. And I suggest, you know, maybe people that are close to you, it's a bit difficult, more difficult to do than, than strangers you don't know, or vice versa, all depends on 
and how you are and where your own pride is and your own ego is. But when we do this, we're disrespecting other people's views and their knowledge. You know, how does it feel when we're trying to tell somebody something and they're clearly not listening or they know better? I mean, I, in the back of my head, or sometimes not in the back of my head, I'm rolling my eyes, you know, just like, oh my God, of course this person knows everything. And it's really irritating. It's incredibly irritating. So don't be that irritating person. Because if you don't like it, then how is that other person sitting in front of you feel? How is that going to affect relationships? How is that going to affect getting a new job or getting on with people in your job? And how is that going to give you a positive, satisfying life? People won't want to be around us, you know? And it also prevents self-growth and development. If I sit here and I thought, oh, you know what? I just um, taught this, taught, not taught, but gave this talk about pride. And then my monk mentor comes and says, actually, Sarah, you got some things wrong. And this is what you should do about it. No, uh -uh, you don't know. I read about it and I looked up all these websites and I made sure it was a reliable one. And it's the Dalai Lama that told me this and everything. You know, that's, that's not my personal growth or development because... As I was researching this, I mean, they talk about, so pride is one of the six poisons uh, in Buddhism. But there's, I mean, there's, there's poisons, there's afflictions, there's blah, 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 but then there's seven types of pride. And each one causes its own issue. And I was kind of thinking, like, why do I need to know about these seven types of pride? You know, what's, what's the point? Um, but actually, what, what um, the uh, Thupten children was saying is that when we occupy our minds with something that we don't understand, with something so huge, it doesn't give space for the ego to come in. You know, it's, it's if we clear the mind and really think in an open way, with an ego-free mind, then it can't come in and feed us all of this negative stuff, you know. And pride also is with being the worst at something. So... Oh, I'm the worst girlfriend. Like, I never cook, I never clean, he does everything, but I'm the worst girlfriend. You know, I just, I suck. Like, honestly, nobody would ever want to be my girlfriend. Or, you know, oh, I'm the worst friend. Can you believe it? Like, I never, I know that my friend was going through a tough time and I just totally ignored her. Like, I'm, I'm awful. And if you, if you notice the way that I'm saying it, it's with purpose. It's, oh, I'm just so bad. It's, you can say the same, I'm so good. I'm the best at this, at that. So it's, it's the opposite, and it's also feeding the ego, and it's also feeding this thing that I'm the center of the universe because I am the worst. I'm not the best, I'm the worst, but I'm still, it's me, me, me. Give me, you know, feed me something. You need to make me feel better. So it's really interesting how all of this um, makes us central to the universe, but it's also really linked to self-esteem, low self-esteem. And so if you, you know, I've done quite a few meditations on that and I because I think it's important and I think because in our society we've grown we've brought up to be an individual instead of be proud in a group collective we are raised to be individuals and therefore our egos are massive and we feel like we deserve all of these things so really working on our self-confidence because we aren't you know like it's okay nobody is perfect at everything and nobody is perfect all of the time. Even yet, um, I still send text messages to people like, oh, this is such a mean thing to say, just don't send it. Send, you know, it's like, and then I go through a moment of madness and it was even happening as I'm researching and like with this Buddhist mind, of course, I should put my phone away and just focus on what I'm doing, that's another issue. But you know, it's, um, we're, we're allowed. And then I can go back and I can think from that, now what was it that was driving me? Why did I feel the need to say that thing when I know it's hurtful or harmful? And, and then hopefully I do it less. And then one day, hopefully I, I never do it. This lifetime or another, if you depend on various lifetimes. One, another thing, just before we start getting settled in, is that I found it interesting is that we grow up with the idea that we need to humiliate someone in order to compete. So it's much more, as I said, it's much more healthy to be, feel a part of a group. But I always say that's one thing I don't like about American culture. It seems like you can walk on people's back, backstab them to get to the top. And I'm mostly talking about, you know, CEO type jobs where to me, 
you know, I know they're important to play a society, part in society, but really, like, it's, um, I don't know, why would you totally turn on a really good friend that you work with to make more money? Because you're not making a difference in the world, like a true difference where you're saving somebody's life. You know, those doctors and stuff, I mean, I'm sure there are some, but generally, you don't hear of them backstabbing or, you know, putting someone in the thick of things to get better. Like, it's just, it's terrible that we do that. And, and again, when, with the winning, it's like, yes, I win. And when you're dancing around, and even when you watch American football games, like, honestly, those, I don't know how old they are, because I always thought they were quite old, but they're probably under 30. But they, you know, like, slam the ball on the football field and think they're just this most amazing thing. And I just look at them, I've always looked at them like, what is wrong with you? But they're humiliating. Then, you know, the camera pans to the other team who's just like, oh, man. And it's a form of humiliation. Why do we want to humiliate people? We don't like it. So we can feel good about ourselves or something that we've done, but it's important not to compare ourselves to others. And you can even say, you know, wow, okay, so this text message that I do because I just want to like just rile somebody up or just get back at them because they hurt me. And I can think, I really want to send that message, but I didn't. You know, like, well done today for not doing that. But we don't have to be the best and we don't have to be the worst at everything. That's where the pride comes in. It's just that we have to be good. Um, we don't have to be, but we can feel good about things that we've done. And it's good, you know, in Buddhism, they, at the end of the day, they suggest that you evaluate what you've done right. And this is coming straight from the Dalai Lama's mouth, you know. So it's about what you've done good that day. Not better than anybody else, not comparing yourself, what to you, how have you um, contributed to your self-development and self-improvement. So hopefully that makes sense and people's egos are pacified by the fact that you can still be proud but maybe not in the way that you're used to saying the word, I feel proud. Um, and I didn't, in the beginning, do the little warm up. So if we need to move, because I've been chatting for a long time, if we need to move or make any adjustments, I can't really, this pain in my back is bothering me, so I can't really do too much, but just making whatever adjustments, movements we need to do. And closing the eyes. And coming into our open space, our safe space. And I have the window open today, the door open, so you can hear the birds singing. Imagining this open space free from distractions, free from other people. Lengthening the breath, bringing more oxygen into the brain to evoke a sense of peacefulness, of relaxation. Noticing any smells or sounds or temperature changes in the place where we are. Maybe breathing out a sigh of relief. <sighs> Knowing that we're in this place where we get to have an open mind without judging ourselves, without the judgment of others. Being forgiving to ourselves and accepting. Nobody is good or bad. We all have our own struggles. And today's meditation on pride is going to focus on this idea of a group collectiveness. And this is actually one of the reasons why I fell in love with Buddhism, because I used to have this feeling that I had to do everything alone, that I couldn't accept help from anybody. And what Buddha 
says, or what I learned from the teachings, is that's absolutely ridiculous. There's not one thing in life, not one. And if you do find it, please send me a message or write me a comment that we've done alone or without the help of others. Coming to this question, what can I do absolutely alone without any past or present help of others? And I think you'll find your mind is gonna to wanna to find something. Oh, well, I taught myself how to play piano. Well, in order for that to happen, somebody had to make the piano. Somebody had to give you the um, opportunity to play the piano. So there was somebody maybe had to buy a piano or take you to a house to lend the piano. So whilst the actual act of touching the keys you may have done yourself, you couldn't do it completely alone. This is actually one of my favorite meditations to do because you can sit and do this for half an hour. And it's pretty interesting to, to observe where the mind goes, to observe, or to try and, you know, find something, but actually, you know, there, there isn't. And then it's, it's this whole sense that we get that we're really connected to everybody else. And what did I learn by myself that did not depend on others? Reading, enjoying music or a movie, driving a car. So anything beyond what an animal can do. Did you pick up a book and immediately know how to read? Where did the book come from? Did you make the book? Did you write the words? Where did my body come from? Whilst we can make ourselves healthy or unhealthy, athletic or non-athletic, where did the body come from? Did we actually do that? Realizing that Pride is the same as attachment, only this time it's exaggerating my own good qualities. So I'm attached to myself, to my self-worth. I must be the best or I must be the worst. And bearing this in mind, if there's somebody who's very proud that we know in our lives, do we like them? Do we spend time with them? Again, it's this whole, this whole um, cycle of, you know, it's, if we don't like the way other people behave, then why would we behave like that? We aren't different, we're all the same, you know. Like people tend to like those kind of peop certain kinds of people and others for not. Nobody likes a know-it-all. But what is this sense of pride in the, you know, in the sense of being a know-it-all? Is it caused by a lack of steam, a lack of self-esteem? a lack of self-confidence? Am I trying to be more than I actually am? And 
And sometimes a really good way to work on self-esteem is to accept that we don't know something and say that to somebody, I don't know. And inside our insides of our minds might be going mental, like, oh my goodness, you just said you don't know. But actually when we realize that people like that, because it's real, it makes you human, and they still accept us, then that's when the growth comes, that's when the self-esteem builds. And one final question to analyze. What is harder to do? To be a fool and think myself better than other people or to be wise and humble? If we don't like feeling inferior to others, why should we behave in a way that makes us look superior to them? I make mistakes, you make mistakes, we're all okay. And taking a deep breath and sitting on this maybe new wisdom or some a different point of view than we've heard before. And maybe even, um, you know, just putting something in the back of our heads to think about, or that we want to explore later, you know, maybe something that we want to look up or feel free to ask me. If I don't know, I'll point you in the right direction. I'm not too proud in that sense. And putting whatever it is into our rucksack in a sense of wisdom and humbleness to know that we are neither inferior or superior to others, but that we are all in this world together, suffering in our own ways, but suffering. Placing the rucksack on the back holding our shoulders up high, feeling good that we took the time today to give ourselves a different perspective or to remind ourselves of something we already knew. And coming back into whatever reality that we are in, the sense of humbleness, the sense of wanting to make others feel good and a sense that maybe we've put down a notch and there's nothing wrong with that. We don't wanna to be too inflated or too deflated. And gently opening the eyes, becoming aware of the surroundings where you are. And um, I forgot to say the four immeasurables again. So as we, I'd like you, as I recite this, dedicating this to somebody who might need some strength, who maybe could use wisdom of this kind. May all beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May they be free of suffering and the cause of suffering. May they never be dissociated from the supreme happiness, which is without suffering. May they remain in boundless equanimity, free from attachment to close ones and rejection of others. And forgiving yourself for maybe the ego got a hold of you during that session and your mind was spinning, that's okay. Maybe you had a hard time focusing, that's okay. Some days are better than others. This takes a lot of years of practice for some not for others, but remembering that we are all equal. 
and I thank you very much for attending today. If you have any questions or comments, please send me a message or write on the comments box. So thank you very much. And I'll be doing my last